That's a lot of people. <laughs> it's coming up fast. <clears throat> Quite a lot of people who watch as well are part of the journalism group too. Right. Because we're all kind of at kind of the same level. <laughs> well, obviously some are higher, but we're at the kind of starting out point. Hi everyone. Twenty-three people already. Sounds really on time. <laughs> I'm always there like five minutes afterwards. Like, oh, gonna miss it. I'm really super on time. I'm I'm very impressed that everybody uh, still wants to do journalism given the current climate we're in. <laughs> I know it's a bit depressing, isn't it? But you know what? You've got to be in it to win it. Yeah, then again, it's very exciting as well for journalism. I always say that there's a, it's actually really easy to get into journalism, but staying in journalism is the, is the tricky bit. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Well, I guess, yeah, journalism is getting quite a backlash at the moment from people. <laughs> I guess it makes it exciting. Right. Okay, I'll wait a couple more minutes. Right. Properly. It's actually going to be a good one because we haven't actually had anyone from the like investigative side of journalism yet. So. And you're normally doing print as opposed to broadcast. What's the what's the deal? We just kind of, we we only started in March, was it, Lucy? No, yeah, we, I think, yeah, it's the sort of end of March, I think. And then we just kind of people write articles for us, videos, and then we've just started doing these workshop kind of things so that all of us can kind of learn from other people in journalism. Okay, so it's 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 kind of a mixture of written and broadcast. Yeah, yeah, and it's particularly women we're focused on at the moment because it started from young women journalists so kind of that's what works at the moment but we're looking at kind of being more inclusive obviously but yeah that's where we start as so that's where we're at the moment mm -hmm. can we wait a couple more minutes <coughs> a few more people in yeah that's right because that's me telling for five past so <coughs> Hi everyone. Okay, we'll give it one more minute and then we'll start. Just leave it on a little too long. <laughs> We're not 100% sure if the video is going to be shared at the end, but we'll let you know. Sorry, that's just responding to someone in the comments. Was it sure? Yeah. Maybe it's five, there we go. Okay, so I think we may as well start now because it's five past. Okay, so hi everyone, I'm Izzy. I'm obviously part of Empowered Journalism and I'm also a common editor for my university magazine. Um, I'm really excited to be hosting this workshop today along with Lucy. Lucy, if you want to introduce yourself. Hello everyone, um, I'm Lucy. I, where am I? Graduated from Exeter, went, went travelling for a couple of years and then got back and starting my NCTJ diploma soon. And um, along with Izzy, I'm part of Empowered Journalism, which is a kind of publication all about showcasing um, young people's work, um, mainly about their experiences of lockdown um, and the pandemic. So do let us know if you want to get involved after the workshop, because we're always looking for new contributors. And I'll go, I'm going to be asking questions in the Q&A in the second half. So if you have any questions, just pop them in the chat and I'll be able to ask them at the end. Also, just before we properly start, this is being recorded. So 
Um, if you don't want to be in the video, then turn your cameras off, but we're not sure if it's going to be recorded for after, so it's just in case. Okay, so today we're joined with Tamana Rahman, who's an RTS award-winning investigative journalist and documentary director. Um, Tamana, if you want to introduce yourself. Uh, yeah, hi everybody. Wow, I'm really excited. I've never actually done this before, uh, and I'm quite uh, unnerved by how many people have joined. Uh, so thanks very much to, to you guys for having me. Um, yeah, so I'm a uh, producer and director. Uh, I'm freelance, but I've worked primarily with uh, the BBC and Channel 4 and a little bit with Vice as well um, in mostly long form current affairs uh, journalism and uh, investigative journalism for uh, broadcast television. I've been in the industry for about 12 years or so, I would say, um, and I've done um, an enormous number of things. So I've worked, I started off kind of training in print, uh, I worked in radio, uh, I've worked in daily news, and uh, for most of my career it's been kind of current affairs, investigation um, type uh, documentaries. Um, the first question I just want to ask you, I'm just going to jump straight into the questions, is was this an area of journalism you were always kind of looking to get into? What was kind of your journey into journalism? Because as I said to you before this call started, a lot of people watching this are kind of at the starting point or quite early in their career. So what was kind of your journey into it and were you always wanting to be in this area? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I knew since I was about 14 or 15 that I wanted to be a journalist. Um, for a variety of reasons. Um, but I think in a really weird way, one of the things that was always really kind of, I found quite a romantic and very idealized kind of notion of journalism was um, uh, watching The New Adventures of Superman, which, I mean, you're probably all a bit too young to remember, but it was uh, Dean Kane and Tony, uh, Terry Hatcher playing uh, Superman and Lois Lane. and. I was always excited by this idea of Lois Lane going out to find the baddies and kind of exposing what was going on in the world. And I think for me, that was always my kind of idea of journalism. It's sort of telling people, hey, look, this is what's going on. And you should, um, and, and, and you should pay attention. You should know what's going on. And I kind of had these ideas. I mean, I, I definitely wasn't going to be breaking into people's offices and kind of looking in like filing cabinets and that sort of thing. Um, but I, but I like the idea of kind of meeting um, people and essentially, you know, revealing stuff about the world. Um, you know, people ask, you know, what exactly is investigative journalism? And one of the best things that um, that I've heard and that's always stuck with me is investigative journalism is essentially you're trying to find something out that other people don't want you to know, and it's in the public interest to kind of to to, to, to get that information out there. Um, so for me, I, I had always wanted to, I had like a very binary idea of the world, which is split into kind of good and evil. And it's not, it's not like that in real life, obviously, there's a lot of gray areas and there's um, kind of, there's complexities in the world, but it's always a kind of like, okay, there are these bad people and we have to expose them so that we can become better people. So it's a really kind of uh, naive idea, but that's kind of where I started from. Yeah. And um, what was kind of your route into journalism? So we obviously we've been told by quite a lot of people that there's all different routes, but what was your specific kind of? Um, I, I, I took a lot of advice before I uh, got into uh, journalism. journalism. Um, I always knew from the very beginning, uh, a lot of people have told me don't do journalism as a degree um, because journalism is one of those skills that you, you learn on the job. Um, and you don't even, a lot of people that I've met don't even have journalism qualifications at all. Um, they've often, you know, gone into radio or they've gone into newspapers as a, you know, kind of T-boy or something like that. And they've managed to, because journalism is, is a skill, it's a craft. It's not something necessarily that you can learn, um, you know, by uh, doing essays and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, which is not to say that you can't do journalism, but as in, for me, the, the thing that I was always told is, you know, try and do a degree that's related, like history or law or English or something like that. So I did a, I did a, a history degree at the University of Manchester. Um, and in my final year of my degree, which I was doing terribly in, I was really, really terribly 
performing in that final year of my degree. And I was thinking, oh crap, I don't have any journalistic. I used to write for the newspaper, for the, for the um, student direct newspaper. But other than that, there wasn't really anything that I was doing. So I applied for a work experience scheme at the BBC uh, in Manchester, because I'm also from Manchester. Um, and it was a four week placement and it had nothing to do with journalism whatsoever. It was just working in the religion and ethics department, which was based in Oxford uh, Road at the time. Um, and um, by some miracle, I got into I, I, got, I got into the work experience and I, and I learned very quickly that many people who apply for work experience are strongly well, they're just really, really inappropriate um, because they don't have. Um, I don't know, even like the, the, the kind of like a, de like a basic level of academic skills, you know, they, 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 they may not have been, able, they, they might not know how to talk to people, they might be a little bit awkward in terms of how they write emails and that kind of stuff. And so when I came in and I had like, and I had the ability to write um, an article, they were like, wow, that's really impressive. And I was like, huh? And they told me that, that they, they told me that at the time that a lot of people were kind of um, put off by applying for work experience because they thought you needed all of these skills. So actually the, the application on the work experience did say you needed all of these skills. So it put off people who were really very, very qualified, very, very talented, but they thought that they weren't good enough. And what ended up happening was that they often had people who were maybe uh, slightly, um, you know, less qualified, but had a, a, a lot of confidence. Um, and, and so I got into a work experience. Um, I worked there for a few weeks. They really liked me. And eventually they offered me a, a contract. Um, and I moved within that department to radio and to television. And eventually I decided I really need to get into journalism because what I was doing back then was, was more program making. Um, and so I did my NCTJ, NCTJ qualification. Again, I'm in broadcast, I was in broadcast at the time, but I felt I really needed to do um, a print qualification because again, <laughs> I felt this is kind of the lowest lane sort of, um, I think slight, um, I don't know, arrogance about it. And I, and I don't believe that it's the case at all anymore. But at the time, I always felt like, you know, newspaper journalism, print journalism, that's kind of the real hardcore journalist type route. So even though I'm going to stay in broadcast, because broadcasters, where the, where the jobs are, essentially, everybody was telling me, look, don't, you know, don't go into print journalism, especially local journalism, because it's dying. So I thought, okay, even if, even if it's the case that I'm going to stay in, stick, stick with broadcast journalism, I still want the skills to, to that you learn from the NCTJ, which is a newspaper qualification. I'm really glad that I did that. So um, I did the NCTJ. I did it part time because I didn't want to lose my job at the BBC uh, at the time. Um, and then I um, uh, then I applied internally for um, a work experience uh, placement in Panorama. Uh, that was for four weeks as well, uh, and it was down in London. And again, by some miracle, <laughs> I managed to uh, get accepted onto it. Um, and then, so I did that for four weeks and then I was back in Manchester after feeling really glum because I didn't really feel like my career was going anywhere. And then out of the blue, I had a call from the Panorama people saying, hey, we need somebody to do some undercover work um, for this project about um, racism in the UK. Would you be interested in taking part? And I was in my, internally, I was jumping up and down. I was like, oh my God, this is so amazing, Panorama. I was 23 or 24 at the time. Panorama was like, the pinnacle of journalism uh, and they wanted me to do this undercover report and I wasn't going to be on screen or anything I was just going to be like doing this you know collecting information with this camera in my front pocket in my front uh, front button um, and I was like yes and after like a really long sort of audition process it probably took about six months six to eight months I think they eventually said okay yeah we definitely want you to go into it um, so I went undercover into this estate and because of what happened to me I ended up um, being the main person who was because uh, they weren't expecting me to to get most of the racist abuse but I, I did get most of the racist abuse um the evidence that they had gathered didn't kind of demonstrate that women were kind of on a daily receiving and they they, they saw a lot they what the evidence was in that kind of uh, research was that a lot of the uh, violence was against men you know being beaten up um, having things thrown at them, things thrown, thrown through the letter, letterbox. I was always going to be the secondary person. But what ended up happening was that most of the daily abuse, uh, the, the, the kind of the name calling, the bullying, the harassment, um, rocks thrown, glass thrown, bottles thrown, that kind of thing, that was happening to me. So I ended up being the face of the program. 
And I was like, oh my God, like, I can't believe this. And I couldn't tell anybody at the time either because it was all secret and in Panorama, everything. If you're doing an investigation, you don't tell anybody. Even my parents didn't know what I was up to for, for, for two months of my life. They were like, where are you? I was like, oh, I'm just hanging around, mum. <laughs> and uh, it ended up being a really, really uh, important uh, kind of program. I won Young Journalist of Year uh, at the RTS uh, for it back in 2010. Um, which was uh, which was really awesome, and then it pretty much kind of moved on from there. That's crazy. That is proper like detective type stuff, isn't it? <laughs> I think that's what people envision investigative journalism to be, kind of like. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's I think that's absolutely right. I think if you if you want to be a investigative journalist, I often feel that your job is very much like a detective, or it's like a police officer. Um, investigating a crime um, and sometimes you will be doing stuff that is um, following up what police haven't done either because I haven't had the time for it or maybe because they just haven't put the, the resources into it whatever it happens to be essentially your, your job as an investigative reporter is 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 to build up a case it's it's you know you're, you're essentially talking to as many people as possible you're trying to find out what is you know the, what is the story here um, it's essentially a puzzle. I mean, a, a, a kind of thinking about what, what, what makes an investigation, what makes a story. Um, and, you know, I mean, like I said, it's, it's what is happening in the world that somebody else doesn't want you to know about. And is it in the public interest for people to know about that story? And it can be anything. It can be, I remember when I first started out, uh, well, not when I first started, just a little bit after, um, there was a guy who had put forward this idea about, um, fairgrounds and about theme parks and he was basically doing all this research on how safe theme park rides were um and the editor decided ah, no, i'm not going to go for that story um but then a few years later you had that smiler incident at alton towers and the girl you know who lost her lost her leg um and so really it's about it's about looking around at the world thinking what is what is going on where, where are some questions um that you know, are not being answered and that I'm interested in. And there's really a few components that you have to think about in terms of what makes an investigative story. The first one is, you know, if, if you think about it like a mystery, if you think about it like a mystery story, that's essentially what an investigation is. What you need, first of all, is um, a victim or you need case studies. You need somebody who is being affected by this particular issue, whatever it happens to be. Um, and the second thing is, very much like the Superman stories, you need a baddie. Uh, you need who are the people who are doing this or what is what is the thing that is you know creating this particular issue um and so it's kind of the victim the baddie um who's not always the baddie sometimes so as i said it's, a bit, it's sometimes complex um but essentially who's the person that you're kind of you know kind of blaming essentially for this the third thing would be who's a scientist who's the person who's done a little bit of research on this particular topic um, who I can see as an objective uh, uh, outsider, somebody who can actually put this information into context for me. Um, and then connected to that is, is there a wider story that this relates to? So when I think about stories, I think about issues from a, a national point of view, because that's the kind of broadcast kind of arena that I'm working in. But actually on a local level as well, as well you know, you can, you can have a look at a situation that's, for example, the story of the Sunday Times this this weekend, um, with the, um, so the essentially a sweatshop factory in Leicester, right? You've got a whole bunch of people who are working for less than minimum wage. That is a local story, but then there's a there's a, a wider national angle as well, which is the the whole COVID issue. Um, so so when you think about investigations, what you're thinking about really is is those four things. One is the victim, who's getting affected. Um, Who's the baddie in this case? Who is an objective person who can put it into context and give me more information? They may, they may not have the victim. They may not have the, the specific people, the, the human side of it, for example. They'll, they'll just know the data often. Uh, and then what is the wider angle to this, to this story? Yeah. And yeah, I guess it shows that there's kind of all different components that come together to kind of create this investigation. Um, yeah. Uh, what I, the next question I wanted to ask you is, obviously you've done a lot of documentaries, you've done a lot of work on, um, in investigative journalism like you just mentioned. What was kind of the most difficult piece of work or documentary you've ever done, whether that be in finding contacts or whether that be because of the emotional aspect of the topic matter? Um, 
every single story that I've ever worked on has been painful. It is like giving birth. When you work in current affairs, I mean, I've never given birth. I'm sure it's worse to give birth. <laughs> but you feel because you're often carrying this story for a very long time. And investigative journalism is an incredibly resource um, kind of rich or it, it, it requires a lot of resources, which is why there's issues with funding and, 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 and kind of people complaining about not having original stories um, because it takes time. You know, you start off with an idea and it can take you between, you know, anything from a few, few months, minimum it takes to put together a documentary is I would say three months and that's, a fast, that's usually a fast turnaround, up to a year, two years even. Um, and every time, there are struggles because what you're doing essentially is you're working on information that is new. You're working on information that nobody knows often or that as, or a side that people haven't heard of before. So make no mistake, this is an incredibly challenging area of journalism. Also because you're, you're racked with self-doubt because what if your information is not right? What if your information is, you know, one-sided? What if there's something that you've, that you've missed? Um, so every single story, and, and, and also when you work in, when you work in broadcast, it, there's a positive and a negative to it because in broadcast, there are so many layers of people who check over your work. You'll have maybe, uh, an executive, you might have a deputy editor or editor, you'll have editorial policy of all these people who are checking on what you're doing and checking what you're saying. And they'll be, they'll essentially be challenging every single point that you're making. And you have to be robust enough to say, yes, this is what happens to these people. And this is um, essentially the facts of the case. And this is the evidence that I've got for this. So, and, and sometimes it's, it's really heartbreaking. And there's, there's various times where I felt, oh God, do I want to do this anymore? Because it's, it's, it's kind of soul destroying. Um, so that, there hasn't been a story where I haven't found it challenging, but probably one of the most challenging stories that I've done is, um, so there's a series on the BBC um, last September, which was called Spotlight and the Troubles. Um, and it's an eight part series, um, which is looking at the history of um, what happened during the uh, conflict in Northern Ireland. Um, it's 50 years on, um, as it was last year since the British army uh, came into, uh, in, 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 into Northern Ireland. Um, and as part of that story, we have to try and uncover um, what happened for, for my two episodes. We have to uncover what happened to um, people who were being um, impacted by, by people who were, who were loyalists. Um, and one of the stories um, was of this um, family who, what ended up happening was they had, um, they had a big family. They were living sort of in the middle of Northern Ireland. Um, and in, um, I think it was 1985, I think it was 1985 or 1984, I think. I'm not sure. Uh, forget the specific date but anyway um two masked gunmen came into their house on the day of their uh, sister's birthday she was 11 years old and they essentially um came into the house um the 11 year old was in the house um they went past her and they gunned down the two brothers and killed them and we made it as part of the kind of thread of this particular episode to figure out who were the people who killed these two boys um, and that was, that was a really painful, um, kind of experience because what, what we had there was we, we definitely had a victim. We had a, fa a whole family who were affected by this particular crime. Uh, we knew roughly that there were baddies. We didn't know who they were. Um, and obviously lots of people are experts in terms of the, you know, kind of context of, of, of the troubles. Um, so, and this family wanted to know who killed the, 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 you know, two sons or their, their brothers and, and why. Um, so it's a case of, right, how do we, how do we get information? This is 25 odd years since the, the, the murder of these, um, of these boys. How, how do we um, tell, the, how, how do we essentially un unravel this mystery? And it was incredibly difficult because this is a family who's still in mourning. Those boys were, you know, they're like 19 years old, 20 years old at the time, 18, something like that. They, they, I mean, they weren't, they, they, they were just, just coming into adulthood. And when the parents spoke about the um, impact of the murders on them, I mean, that was incredibly traumatic. Um, you know, for two days, I couldn't kind of sleep because I was thinking, oh God, this is really traumatic. This is, this is awful. 
And then on the other side, we found out one of the guys um, who was um, involved in the plot to kill the two boys. We actually got to him. We traveled to Scotland. We knocked on his door and we said, yo, can you tell us about what was going on during this time? And he eventually told us, you know, most of what had happened. And it was very difficult hearing from him as well what led up to this particular murder, how it happened, what his particular involvement was. He, he didn't actually kill them. He had gone to jail by the time they were, by the time they were killed, but, but he was involved in kind of the, the, the kind of group who, who, were, who were, you know, plotting it. So, you know, that was a difficult one because it's a, it's a really emotional story. Um, so I'd say that's probably one of the most challenging ones because you want to do the right thing by those people. Yeah, I guess so. It can be both kind of emotional and difficult, but also, I guess, rewarding at the same time if you get kind of an outcome out of it. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that the father had been saying for a really long time in this particular story was that, look, for, for, for such a long time, for, for so many years, I've been saying to people, look, we were targeted by this particular group of men. We had the police who, you know, avoided our, you know, our street and essentially he said enabled this particular group to come in and do what they, you know, do what they eventually ended up doing. You know, he felt that he was somebody who was marked um, and people thought that he was, you know, crazy and people thought that he was, you know, exaggerating. Um, and for a long time, he felt kind of like he was being gaslit, I think uh, is probably the best way to describe it. Um, and although we couldn't kind of pinpoint who the specific murderer was, um, on on the program um actually for us to be able to say look this is what happened this is how they did it this is what the plan was your family had been targeted for at least a year you know it made him feel like yes i feel vindicated like you know i'm not crazy i'm not this mad person who's like you know thinking all these kind of um conspiracy plots and all that kind of stuff so when you speak to the family and you say look this is this is what's happened and this is what the plan was and in fact you know, you're lucky that your other son wasn't there because he would have been killed as well. It's kind of, it's kind of haunting, but yes, rewarding at the same time as well. And I think that's why you do it in the end because of all the pain and all the kind of um, heartache that you go through at the end of the day, if you can make life a little bit easier or you can, you know, kind of solve some issues and then that's a great feeling. The flip side is sometimes you create more problems. I mean, even with the story of the Sunday Times, um, for example, that was uncovered by some student journalists, actually, um, from uh, Leicester University, De Montfort University, um, on a Channel 4 MA scheme. Um, you know, yes, it's great that this, these, these um, factories are being revealed as kind of almost engaging in slave labour. But at the same time, I imagine a lot of the, the people who work in those factories, they need their jobs. Um, and that's the only reason why they're working there. So you kind of have to balance out that sometimes you uncovering certain things might in the short term um, be problematic, but hopefully in the long term will we'll lead to kind of improvement. Yeah, I guess you could say that kind of a difference with investigative journalism is you kind of take some of that home with you, whereas like in, in other areas you kind of present a story and then it's kind of done with, whereas with investigative journalism you kind of take it home with you and you kind of carry yeah. the emotional kind of effects of it. Do you think you need any specific extra skills to be an investigative journalist that you don't necessarily in another area? Um, I think I think you have to be dogged and I think you have to be persistent and I think you have to be quite tenacious because you're going to get a lot of people closing doors on you. Um, you know, as I was saying earlier, this is an area where you're trying to uncover information that people don't want you to know. So there's going to be a lot of people who will tell you, um, there'll be a lot of people who don't want to tell you stuff and that stuff is evidence essentially that you want to get. There'll be people who maybe are campaigners and who have a particular point of view that they, acts that they want to grind. Um, and there'll be people who are so traumatized by what they have gone through or are going through that they don't want to talk. Um, and I think that when you're an investigative journalist, what you need is tenacity, you need also sensitivity in terms of, um, you know, the people that you're dealing with and really you, you need to be, have quite good people skills as well because you're essentially trying to get people to tell you things uh, that they wouldn't ordinarily tell. I mean, I would say that in the, in the Spotlight and the Trouble series, uh, which was on last year, 
um, I had a reporter called Mandy McCauley. Um, so we worked together for two programs. And I have to say, as a journalist and as an investigative journalist, I mean, her people skills were second to none. I would, we, we came to this one person's house um, and we needed, we wanted to persuade them to come on TV to talk about their father being killed um, and shot um, by, by, a member of a, by a member of a loyalist organization. <laughs> and um, they invited us to their house. Um, so the wife was there, or the ex-wife. Um, no, no, actually the wife, yeah. Um, yeah, so his wife was there and two of the kids were there who are now adults. They were probably about six or seven at the time. Um, and the mum was like halfway through saying, yeah, I'm not really sure I want to be involved and I'm not sure I want to tell this story. And so my instinct at that point would have been like, oh, well, thanks very much for your time. You know, um, it's really lovely that you kind of invited us in. But there's some magic that she had where she just kind of managed to carry on talking to them. And eventually they were like, okay, yeah, we'll talk. Now the mum decided that she still didn't want to talk for whatever reason, but the, uh, the, one of the kids said that, yes, I will talk. Um, and I think it's about being able to read the room and she's a very experienced journalist and, you know, um, honestly, her ability to get things out of people is, is, is really impressive. Um, and so I think, I think, you know, their skills that you need, you also need to be very, very organized, uh, in any kind of journalism that you do, particularly investigative journalism, you know, make a note of what are the dates that you've spoken to people who, you know, what have they said? you know, who have they recommended you, you speaking to? So it's, there's, there's a whole raft of skills that you need, but these skills are things that you learn. These are not skills that you automatically have. They are built up over, over many, many, you know, years and many, many types of investigations. Nobody, nobody kind of has an innate ability to be, um, you know, skilled at this kind of stuff. What you need is a questioning mind. You need to think, right, how can I move this along further? Um, and I think that's that's kind of the main that's kind of the main skill you need as a as, as an investigative journalist. You're just constantly questioning, right? What? Where does this come from? How does this come from? Where can I go? Why did this happen? Um, whereas with daily news, and I have worked in daily news for two years. I was a producer on the BBC uh, news channel. You know, you're essentially just reporting what's happening on that day, and you're not really going beyond uh, the reasons why. Um, it helps if you know about it because it means that your writing is more kind of is tighter your, your your writing is clearer um but you don't really need to kind of go beyond the facts of that day um and some people prefer that because you can just drop it at five o'clock and you can carry on with the rest of your life but yeah for sure investigative journalism i mean i i am working on a project at the moment uh where i took a call at 1 a.m in the morning because that's the only time that they were available. Um, so it's kind of, it, you, you don't always get a life when you work in investigative journalism. Yeah, I guess you need some kind of, some forward dedication to your work to be part of it. Um, it's been really interesting to find us out about your personal experiences as an investigative journalist, but um, now we're gonna move on to Lucy, reading out some of our questions that we've got in our Q&A from the people watching. Oh uh, yeah, thank you everybody for your questions. Had to you coming in. Um, yeah, thank you for all that information, Tamana, literally so useful. I'm feeling motivated and inspired now to, you know, do some investigations. So, um, okay, so a few, I've tried to group them. Um, there's a few about more kind of practical things. The first being um, something I'm actually wanting to know as well is just how it works with um, sort of job security and things. So, you know, a lot of people in this industry are usually freelance, but then how does it work in terms of, obviously if you work for the BBC, like, do you have to pitch investigations or are there things that are happening anyway and they ask you to get involved? So just how does that work is my question. Um, job security is probably one of the most um, frustrating things about this industry and I think people are trying to see if we can make changes but there is very little job security realistically which makes it very difficult for people who come from maybe working class backgrounds or backgrounds where you don't have that kind of financial cushion to, to, to see you through. Um, and as I said before, it's, it's very labor intensive. So you don't necessarily, especially in the beginning, get paid for the amount of work that you put into a story. Um, and, and that can make it challenging. Um, I would say that, I mean, I have less experience of, of, of investigations in, in, in newspapers uh, and how you might kind of get, um, 
get your story in the paper from that point of view. But, but if you're starting off trying to be an investigative journalist in broadcast, then you don't need to do a huge amount of work already prepped before you go to somebody who's a commissioner uh, in a particular broadcaster. So either so the way that it works, I mean, I don't know if you know how television works, is you have something like the BBC, which has its own in-house investigation teams in a variety of different kind of um, you know, genres. Um, and they're in-house teams, which if you get a job with an in-house team, that's great. Then you're pretty much, you know, um, you're not set, but certainly it's a little bit easier. Or alternatively, you have independent companies who will work for Channel 4, who will also work for the BBC. And you'd go to those individual companies. Um, in, either, in, in both cases, in either of those cases, you might go with an idea. You might go with them and you might go to one of them. You, you'd have a look at which program it is that you want to work on or which strand you want to work on. Figure out who the um, executive is or figure out who the deputy editor or the editor is. And you'd write them an email and you'd say, hey, dear whoever, um, my name is whatever. I'm a student journalist or, uh, and I have this idea because I've seen X, Y, and Z happen. Um, and I have these people, would you be interested in covering this as a, as a story? Um, or would you be, you know, could, could, could I come and have a chat with you about this story? Um, and you don't actually need to have done a huge amount of work on it because actually what you're trying to do is to build experience first of all. So you're going to that individual person and you're saying, look, I've got all these ideas about X, Y, and Z. Could I come and have a chat with you and talk to you? Could I maybe have some work experience with you um, and see how it works, see how your program works, see how your company works um, for a couple of weeks? That's probably a better way of you getting in to journalism, uh, in, into investigative journalism, just by figuring out what is the lay of the land of that particular, um, of that particular you know, strand or, or program. Um, because nine times out of 10, your story probably is going to be something that they've heard before. Nine times out of 10, they may have already got somebody on that story. Um, you might have like an extra element to it, which is great. And you should definitely take advantage of that. Um, and nine times out of 10, they'll already have like a list of stories that they've got done for a, you know, they've got like a, a, a slate of ideas that they've been working on for a very long time. And they're going to pitch those ideas based on, you know, their own particular timings. Um, so I, I don't think that you need to necessarily have it all set out and all ready. What you need is an idea. You might need, to, you, you might have some people who are victims and you might say, look, this is really interesting. I'm, you know, I'd really love to work on this story. Can I come and do some work for you on this? Um, I think that's really the key thing because the, the, there's not very many people, there's maybe one or two people who have had like an idea that's so amazing that the kind of editors or whoever have said, yes, come in and work on this idea. We want you to be a researcher or an assistant producer. Um, but, but largely, I would say, just try and get work experience, if you can, for a couple of weeks. Get to know people. Um, have ideas. You don't need to have worked on those ideas. You don't need to have put any detail on those ideas. But just have ideas and keep going to the editor um, and say, look, this is what I'm interested in. And your passion and your enthusiasm and your tenacity is what is going to keep the editor at the forefront of their mind when they're looking for people to kind of cover certain stories Does that makes sense does that make sense it's kind yeah. of yeah no because we've had we have, we have had quite a few questions of people sort of asking you know what they can be doing now to sort of start getting into investigative journalism yeah. like, you know, work experience is probably the ideal thing but i don't know is there anything else you can think of okay well in the covid situation it's a little it's obviously a little bit a bit more tricky yeah. um i would so it's it's not a, this industry is very in investigative journalism is i think very much based on how much you are um not respected but certainly trusted in terms of your evidence like how how much can i rely on this person that their prima facie evidence is going to be correct and is going to be um kind of reliable in a sense um so even though we're in a covid situation and it's very difficult to go out and and talk to people um or to kind of go undercover and see what's going on or whatever 
there are still things that you can there are still things that you can do there are still ways that you can get ideas i mean even just looking trawling through the newspapers um you know there's there's a there's a for example i was looking at the issue of kind of uh hong kong um and um what's happening in in china um recently and there's a there's, a, there's one story in um the newspapers talking about this guy in university who was being pressured and leaned upon um from other colleagues within the university as well as some officials from 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 um from, from you know hong kong or china or whatever and i was thinking oh that's really interesting is he the only one who's experiencing that kind of pressure is he the only one who's experiencing that kind of level of harassment um and then i started to talk to the people and actually it's a case that you know there are issues with other people who are from a back, you know hong kong background um who are facing um you know difficulties because they're speaking out against what's happening um in uh, back on back in back in china um and you start to talk to, you can still talk to people you can still call people that's that's still available you don't necessarily need to go out there you can just look at a kernel of an idea in a newspaper or a story and think right how can i make this bigger are there other people who are going through this kind of stuff who's the person that's doing this why is the person doing this um, and what is the unique, either local angle, if you're working for a, for a, a local, you know, kind of outlet, or what is the national angle to make it kind of bigger? You know, when, when, you're, when, you're, talking, uh, when you're talking about doing investigations, there's, 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 there's certain things that you do. And a lot, of, a lot of what I do, even pre-COVID, is sitting in an office and staring at a computer. You know, you're talking to people. That's the first thing that you're doing, first and foremost. How can I call people? You have to not be afraid to pick up the phone and have a chat with people. That's the primary thing that you're doing. You're trying to humanize this particular issue. You're looking at and you're analyzing data. Even if you think about, you know, the expenses scandal, which happened about 10 years ago, what ended up happening now was somebody was going through the expenses of, you know, MPs and figuring out, right, what are the things that they're going into the data and they're thinking, that they're thinking oh, this guy, he's paid, like, he's making us pay for his duck mode. I mean, what the hell is that about? You know, how many other people are doing that exact same thing? You're reading documents, you're reading reports, um, you know, whether it's whether you have an interest in medical kind of investigations or science investigations or environment or finance, you know, there's, there's any number of, just pick which kind of area that you're interested in. What are some of the reports? Academics are amazing for, um, you know, trying to find specific stories that you can make, you can make much bigger. Um, because often what they don't, they have the, they have the data, they have all the kind of objective background information that, you know, suggest to you, look, there is an issue here. But you're, what you're doing is you're bringing a human face to that and you're kind of saying, ah, well, look, this is what's happening in this area or this is what's happening in this particular region. So, you know, one of the things that you'd always do is you'd speak to charities for stories, you'd speak to lawyers, you'd speak to academics, you'd speak to campaigners, you try and find whistleblowers, industry insiders, people who are former employees, you know, look for the local, it doesn't necessarily have to be your local, but it can be local in a particular, you know, in, a, in another area. So you're constantly talking to people. That's primarily what you're doing. Um, when it comes to convincing people to talk, sometimes, I mean, a lot of it is very sensitive. So that kind of face-to-face -face communication is massively important. But I think given the situation, you know, as long as you kind of initially make contact, people are understanding of the fact that they can't come and see you. And if they're willing to talk to you, then, then I think, they will be open to at least having a Zoom chat or, or something like that. It's, it's just about talking to people. Um, with one of the cases that I'm doing at the moment, for example, uh, it's a guy who is, um, uh, he says, is being harassed by, by police. Um, so what I did was I somehow managed to, I don't know how I just Googled and I found his phone number, I called him up, he's listening to me. It's clearly like thinking about what's going on. And the thing is you're always coming to these people out of the blue. You're always coming to these people out of the booth, so it's always going to be a shock, especially if it's a sensitive story. So you have to kind of think about how you're approaching them. You have to be quite um, respectful and you have to be quite apologetic, I think, in some cases, and also quite humble. Like, so, you know, I'm, I'm really sorry to bring this up, but I was just wondering if I could have a chat to you about this particular thing or, or whatever. He was listening and he was just like, I'm really sorry, I can't talk to you about this. Um, can you please have a chat with my lawyer? And I said, okay, yeah, no, I'm really happy to do that. Let me have your lawyer's phone number. He gave me his lawyer's phone number, he explained um, much more clearly and much more robustly to the lawyer what the story was that I was doing. And he was saying, yeah, I think you should definitely talk to this person, my client. I'd love you to have a chat with him and get the details. And then because his lawyer had said yes to speaking to me, I got in touch with him more 
directly and end up having like a really, really long conversation about, you know, quite, a, quite an important issue, uh, which will hopefully go on to make, uh, you know, part of the film. Um, so you can still do stuff. It's about looking at stories and, and asking questions and thinking, how can I get access to this person who's got this information? And how can I build up this picture, these case studies that might tell, tell a kind of wider story? Mm -hmm. You know, that's interesting you say that because we do have a question actually on um, about permissions of speaking to people and sort of like how you get people to speak to you and when like legally you can put them yeah. on the record, as well as um, kind of related to that, like whether how much you work with the police and like how the police fit in with your investigations. So those um, the good questions, uh, the complex questions, you, I would say if, uh, if they are over 16, maybe over 18, I need to double check this, uh, you can always talk to them. You can always approach them. It's a question of how you approach them. That's the most important thing. Um, so on a, on a general story, I mean, it's quite difficult to do without kind of revealing um, details and stuff. Um, let me have a think. The ones that you have to be really careful about are sexual assault stories. Because everybody who has been a victim of any kind of sexual assault is automatically um, guaranteed anonymity. Um, so if you're going to go to somebody who has been um, a victim of sexual assault, then you need to consider how did you get that information. And if it's a case that you were in court and you saw them, then you can try and approach them directly, either via social media, dropping a letter, um, you know, knocking on their door, um, going through the police. There's any number of different options that you could potentially do. And you have to think what is the most sensitive way of doing it. Um, when it when it comes to very sensitive stories, uh, when it comes to victims in particular, one of the easiest ways, one of the nicest ways, I think, uh, and one of the consistently kind of, you know, kind of successful ways of doing it is to actually write a physical letter, uh, which you, you know, you've typed up, you've explained who you are, you've said, look, I'm doing this story, I really love to talk to you, there's no pressure to be involved, but I really love to hear your story. Um, you know, if you've got time, um, please contact me on this, um, on, 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 you know, this email address or this phone number. Um, and, you know, it'll be entirely in confidence. Um, and then you post a letter. And then what you do is you give them the opportunity to take in the information in their own time and decide whether or not they want to be involved at their own pace. So... That's probably one of the most successful ways I, I, I would say of doing it. Just, you know, and you can, you can post that letter by hand kind of pre-COVID pre times. You need to make sure it's the right person that you're sending this stuff to as well. But you need, so you need to make sure that, particularly if it's an issue of sexual assault or anything that's very, very sensitive, you need to absolutely 100% make sure that the person that you're sending this letter to is the right person. Because if you're revealing information that is sensitive and potentially harming, then you're, you're essentially liable for that. But assuming it's the right person, that often, uh, that often works. Uh, you can go by the police. The police are not always that helpful. Sometimes they're embarrassed because they haven't done the investigation work that they need to do. Sometimes you know, they're worried about you know, their reputation or whatever. Sometimes they're just busy. Um, but sometimes they can be really helpful. Um, it just depends. You just have to you know, take each, each kind of... Um, story as it comes but the thing to always remember is also you must ask advice these are not things that you would necessarily do on your own and to take your own kind of guidance or counsel on and this is one of the really nice things about working in broadcast as opposed to print where you're left on your own a little bit more i would say um in my experience um in in broadcast you you, you would always ask somebody you know you'd ask somebody who's more senior than you you might ask uh, the person on the legal team you might ask a person on the editorial policy team in broadcast, you work as a team. You're always, you know, kind of trying to essentially make sure you've got the strongest story, the strongest case studies, making sure that you're dealing with people in the most considerate way possible um, because of the various rules and just general, you know, kind of humanity. Um, so that's, that's kind of how I would approach people. I mean, I've often contacted people on Twitter and I've just said, Hey, you know, it's Tamana here. I'm um, working on a story um, for the, you know, whichever outlet it is. You know, I'd really 
love to have a chat with you. Would you mind following me back so I can DM you the details? Um, and so in that way, you're not revealing any information. You're not telling them what they're interested, what you're interested in, but you're just saying, look, can I, can I have a chat with you? Um, and you're starting off from a point of, look, I just want to have a chat. Uh, there's no pressure on you to be involved. If you don't want it to be on, I mean, I would rarely say that, you know, uh, it doesn't have to be on the record. Um, because especially when you're working on, in broadcast, unless you're um, kind of going after a baddie or something like that, one, one of the kind of, um, one of the people who you're kind of trying to, um, you know, kind of un, un, uncover, unless they're being filmed on camera, they're not on the record <laughs> anyway, as, as, as such. Um, but if, but if they say to but if it's a particularly sensitive thing, like, you know, if they're uncovering some sort of wrongdoing at a, a, a big, you know, multinational company or, you know, the government or something like that, then you can say, look, if you prefer, I can, I can put it you know, it can be off the record. Um, and then your job as a, as an investigative journalist is to slowly convince them that, you know, actually you do want to go on camera and try and work through whatever concerns that they might have. And even if they still end up saying, look, I don't want to go. I don't want my face to be on camera because, you know, I'm a whistleblower and I don't want to be, um, you know, kind of harassed for this or because I'm a victim of sexual assault, then there's ways that you can make them anonymous or ways that you can kind of cover their identity, but still have their input in the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Like, definitely what I've learned recently is, like, people are far more willing to talk to journalists than you'd think they were. <laughs> so, yeah, that's good. Um, I think a lot of people want to tell their story. You know, a lot yeah. of people who have a um who are the victim of a particular you know issue whatever it is they they're genuinely from a kind of you know <laughs> i guess from a point of burning injustice they want to tell people their stories um and in fact if you go onto like facebook groups or you know twitter or whatever people are always complaining <laughs> about x y and z um and they're the people that you you go to and you say look tell me what happened and you know you essentially have to become for some people, you have to become their best friend um, and because they're relying on you to tell their story honestly and, and fairly and in as kind of full a way as possible. And, and often that's not possible because of time constraints and, and whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but, but people usually do want to, in my experience, you know, you can, you can usually find somebody who wants to talk and tell you their story. Um, and it's your job to make sure that you've got enough people who are telling the same sort of story to be able to say, yes, look, this is an issue. This is a thing that deserves a bit of, uh, you know, a second look from the authorities or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, completely. Um, okay, we have time for a couple more questions, I think. Um, somebody was asking um, whether you think it's better to be like, get experience in sort of general journalism and then to specialise in investigations or just to delve straight in <laughs> to investigations. Um, not one of, one of the, one of the kind of piece of information or kind of advice that I was given, uh, from very early on is try and get daily work experience. Um, so get the experience of working in a newsroom on a, on a daily basis to get an idea for what stories there are what the institutions are, who the different organizations are, who are important people in X, Y, and Z. Um, so yeah, I'd say if, if you can get a wider, broader experience, that's always, that's always a good thing. Um, the more strings you can add to your bow, um, the, the, the better. I think it just gives you a, you know, often when you're, when you're working in investigations, you're, you're also looking at government policy or you're looking at science or you're looking at environment or, you know, whatever it happens to be. Um, so I would say, yes, absolutely. Um, just get a knack for journalism first, get a knack for telling a story first, um, and figuring out what is a story. And then investigations is, I mean, it primarily is a case of experience. So try and find the right person in a particular organization or in a particular company and say, is it possible for me to have some work experience? Is it possible for me to work on this idea that I've been work, you know, that I've been looking at, um, and, and see where it goes. And I would say that's, that's probably the, 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 the best way. And actually, if you work in, even if you work in, uh, you know, newspapers, um, you know, you can work in a, a, a newspaper, um, and take an idea to a, to a broadcaster and say, look, I've been working on this story for a long time. Um, so it's, 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 there's really not a single way into investigations. It's, it's a case of, do you have an idea? Are there, 
is, is, are there case studies? Is there a particular thing that you're kind of, you know, kind of railing against as it were, or somebody who's a particular, you know, problem? Um, there's not really a linear way. I think, I think if you have an idea and it's a good one, then you can always take it to somebody, and, and, but it doesn't always get accepted. That's the other thing you need to, one of the things that is really difficult, which I said very early, you know, kind of right in the beginning is that journalism is not a career that is easy, that's difficult to get into. Anybody can get into journalism um, if they kind of just make the right connections, but staying in journalism is very, very difficult because you're constantly coming up with ideas and you're constantly getting rejected. And it's really, really hard. Even now at this stage, um, I'm still always distraught whenever I get rejected because of, you know, ideas that I have and, and um, for, from ideas I have. And I think, oh, it must mean that I'm terrible. It must mean that I'm awful. But then like four months later or five years later or 10 years later, it's like, ah, I have that story. I mean, why did nobody pick it up then? And it's really frustrating. Um, just, uh, just as, as an example, like, uh, uh, you know, 10 years ago, I was um, very, very fresh. I just finished this undercover thing that I was talking about. Um, and Panorama had me working. Um, uh, and I basically came up with a story about maternal mortality. So this is women who die while giving birth. And one of the things that I had found was um, that if you're from a black background or you're from an ethnic minority background, your chances of dying while giving birth were much higher. And I was speaking to these charities, I found case studies, and the editor still said no. And I was like, I was like, oh, maybe I'm not good enough. But like recent, like literally today, I saw an article about, you know, in, about mater, maternal mortality. Um, so it's not that your idea isn't good. There could be a number of reasons why it hasn't been accepted. You just have to keep plugging away and really be quite um, resilient and have a, you know, kind of a tough outer shell, really. Yeah, yeah, because, um, well, uh, the question I was just about to ask you as you come to the end is actually about how you manage those setbacks and keep motivated despite all of those sort of rejection. If I, if I knew the answer to that, I mean, that would make me so much of a happier person in life. <laughs> um, the thing that keeps me going is a real sense of justice, which is that kind of lowest lane idea that I had in the very beginning, which is that I can't see something and not pitch it as an idea and not look at ways in which I can kind of tell this story. So I just have this really kind of, uh, I don't know how to describe it, um, inflated sense of ego, probably that, you know, this is a story worth telling and I need to be the one to tell it and I need to be the one to kind of like, you know, uncover this mystery. I'm just, I'm just interested and it doesn't matter how much I get knocked back. Um, <laughs> even in the depths of my despair, about a week later, I'll be like, oh, fine, okay, well, oh, what about this story? People should know about this story. This is terrible, I'm outraged. Um, and that's kind of what keeps me going, just, this, just the fact that maybe one of these ideas will, 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 will work. Maybe one of these things will, will, will make a difference. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is in, in, in journalism, it doesn't matter which kind of journalism that you do, whether it's investigative or daily or kind of a featurey type kind of aspect of journalism, you know, your relationship with other people is the most important thing. So how you work with other journalists, how you work with other uh, kind of program makers, um, it is about connections. So as much as it's about, um, as much as it's about kind of having a good idea, as much as it's about having information that other people don't have, the, the missing link between that particular story and that story coming out is always going to be your relationship with other journalists. Um, and it's an unfortunate thing. It's what makes journalism really challenging, particularly if you come from a background that isn't kind of, um, you know, kind of middle class and, you know, white and from Oxbridge or came, you know, from Oxbridge, um, where, you know, the connections are slightly easier. Um, it, it makes it challenging. Um, you, you just have to continue to make friends with people. You just have to continue to be nice to everybody that you can, because eventually those people will become the people who commission your story. They'll be the people who are like, yeah, no, I thought about that as well. Let's do something. Um, or they'll be the people who uh, respect you and, and re remember you because they know that you have this particular interest or expertise. And they'll be like, yeah, sure. What, yeah, why don't you go and do that? Um, and you can bounce ideas off each other as well. It's not always in a kind of um, mercenary way where you're trying to think ahead about like, you know, how am I going to, um, further my career but but it is an important thing to, to think about you know this sort of journalism doesn't happen in a vacuum um, mm -hmm. you need to know people to, to get your story 
onto the relevant platform. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, we're coming up to three o'clock, but just to put you on the spot for the final time, if you could sum up in a couple of sentences what you think the key takeaway is for advice for getting into investigations, what would it be? Oh, key takeaway. Key takeaway. <laughs> um, okay. Have an inquiring mind. Everything around you could be a potential investigation if you look at it in the right way. Um, talk to people. Try not to be kind of stuck in... I mean, I say make friends with journalists, that's useful for you kind of getting the story out there, but actually talk to other people in the real world. I think journalists sometimes have a problem with sticking to their own social groups and actually your friends outside um, that kind of journalism world are, are, are much more interesting in terms of what's going on in the world. So talk to people um, and be as tenacious and resilient as you can because these are skills that you need where you're regularly having doors slammed in your face so you know potentially keep pushing until you get what you think you're looking for sometimes the stories won't work and that's fine you know you just have to kind of that's just life really but a lot of the times if you have an instinct for something not being right then with enough kind of talking to people you'll, you'll find the story you'll find the story um and and if you have the tenacity to go after to, to kind of then pursue the right people who can put it on a platform and to put you on that story um, and the resilience to not take it personally if they reject it then you're on to a you're, you're you're on your way essentially that kind of the main thing okay amazing well we are at three o'clock now two minutes past um but yeah thank you so much for your time i hope everybody found that useful um, no, thank you very much for having me. Um, yeah, that's okay. I think Isabel just wanted to do a little bit about empowered journalism just to finish us off. Tell us about us. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you so much for coming on. Um, it's been really great because, as I've said before, we haven't had anyone from the investigation side of journalism on yet. Um, if you want to, if anyone watching wants to get involved with empowered journalism or write for us, there's information on our contributors page. We're always open for anyone to write for us because obviously this platform's for kind of young creatives to get some experience, especially during lockdown. So yeah, that's kind of all I had to say. Lucy, do you have to add anything? No, just um, follow everybody on Twitter if you put your handles in the chat. And yeah, hope everyone found it useful. <laughs>